All right, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamal Lewis. I'm the pilot program manager for the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation, and welcome to the Smarter Together webinar series. This webinar series touches upon how multidisciplinary applied research can be used to make a community impact and improve the human condition. I'm delighted this week to introduce some new and ongoing research surrounding ag tech research and opportunities in Georgia. I have the great pleasure of introducing to you our moderator for today's panel, Mr. Doug Britton, Principal Research Engineer at Georgia Tech Research Institute. After Doug's introduction, he will introduce and bring in our other panelists to add to the discussion, followed by a Q&A session with any remaining time. Please remember, we welcome your questions in the corresponding chat area throughout the presentation. Also, please note, um, Anyone outside of the panelists, uh, please remember to keep your uh, sound on mute and your videos off, please. Um, so now, Doug, you can, you can begin whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, Jamal and Christy and Deborah, for the opportunity to be part of this Smarter Together webinar series. We're excited to um, have several great um, participants on the, on the webinar this afternoon. Dr. Harold Sherm is professor and department head of plant pathology at the University of Georgia, where his research interests are in epidemiology of plant diseases and factors that influence um, disease spread. We also have Dr. Jay Xu, who's a research uh, principal research scientist at Georgia Tech uh, at the Research Institute here. And her interest is in the design and development of sensing technologies um, for chemical and biological detection, nanotechnology-based remediation, um, and nutrient recovery recycling, and then volatiles uh, biomarkers for um, precision agriculture. And then Dr. Robbie Godboli is joining us, joining us from AgCo, where he's the manager of research and innovation for the grain and protein division of AgCo. Um, and his, his role is really um, to look at product innovation um, and helps facilitate those conversations with universities, as well as drive um, innovation and out of the box ideas within his company. So we've got a great panel this morning and we're excited to, uh, to talk a little bit about ag tech um, in Georgia and really um, ag tech, um, precision ag and intelligent ag, we're gonna kind of use all of these, these words a little bit synonymously. There might be slight nuances that are different, but for the most part, we're gonna talk about that. Um, and then just talk a little bit about some different areas as well as um, some application spaces, particularly for Georgia. And so I'm gonna lead off and then we'll go into some, uh, each of our panelists. We'll give just a quick overview and then we'll um, entertain some, um, some discussion. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we'll get started. Very good, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm also the manager of the Agricultural Technology Research Program here at GTRI. And our vision is really to transform poultry, agribusiness and food manufacturing through advanced technologies. So we don't have a College of Agriculture or Food Science or Plant Science or Animal Science Department here at Georgia Tech. So we partner very closely with our friends at the University of Georgia and other uh, institutions that have those um, expertise, have that expertise to really deliver technologies um, in support of agriculture. In terms of strategic thrust areas for our program here at Georgia Tech, we're working in the area of advanced sensing. And this is everything from what you're gonna hear <clears throat> Dr. Schuess talk about a little bit, as well as future poultry operations. And this is looking at robotics and automation in poultry activities, as well as agricultural robotics, looking at um, row crop and different sensing and robotics in the crop space. Really, it's a partnership, um, and we're always looking to grow this partnership. And um, all the folks on the call this morning that are panelists have been part of these activities in this partnership. If we take a quick look at the poultry sector, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the protein side of high-tech ag, um, we've got a number of technologies that we see in poultry exist that exist today. And these include high-speed um, processing lines, primarily on the evisceration side, um, machine vision grading systems, um, X-ray screening systems, automated deboning operations to some level, um, water jet cutting and portioning. You can see a picture over here on the bottom right-hand side, um, data-driven statistical processes, um, and then in-process water recycling, and then processes for continuous food safety monitoring. And all of these technologies have been have emerged over the last several 
uh, maybe 10 to 15 years, but they've really allowed us to do a better job of managing throughput, minimizing loss, and maximizing yield in terms of driving value into agriculture. And they're all layered in some way by technology in the ag tech space. So where are we headed in the future? Really, when we look at technology and automation challenges, one of the big challenges is the natural variability of the product. So we start looking at the complexity of encoding manual tasks. This is things that people do very well, but it's very difficult to teach or train or get robots to be able to do the sensing um, and the dexterity in order to be able to do some of these tasks. The other thing is human operators are very efficient. People learn very quickly and they can be repurposed and repro repro repurposed and, and given new tasks very quickly. And that provides necessary production flexibility. And so when we start thinking about automation, it's not just about automating the task, but it's also about providing flexibility in the processing environments that allow us to continue to hit those throughputs that we need to hit for our particular customers, particularly in the food manufacturing sector. So as we look to the future, um, we really see things moving towards what we're calling a lot size of one. This is where we no longer process or manufacture foods to an average or to a statistical uh, standard uh, deviation, but instead we look at each unit coming down the processing line as its own lot. And what it allows us to do is characterize that lot specifically and then process that particular lot. So if you think about an apple or a chicken carcass, each of those are gonna have unique features that we want to be able to optimize against in order to drive maximum yield. And this is gonna require intelligent systems, right? So that we can adapt to each product individually. Eventually, we'd like to see a fully integrated data system across the entire production and processing. So that would go back into the field and also carry into the processing side. And that allows us to do full tracking and traceability across the spectrum. And that's, I think, where we're really going to be pushing in the future. Of course, the end goal is always increased throughput and efficiencies. So my last slide, what are some ways that we're gonna be able to do this, right? And this is a very generic um, slide, but when we start talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's several large platforms and, and, and systems that have emerged over the last um, few years. Um, Google TensorFlow, um, Amazon Alexa, most of you are familiar with that, but all the machine learning that supports that in the Amazon Web Services system, um, all of that is enabling technologies and driving and pushing the frontier for us to be able to push artificial intelligence into what we would call non-uniform product management or non-uniform product uh, processing. We also high computing, uh, high performance computing clusters allow us to really drive energy into computation that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Um, sensing platforms, smartphones, 3D sensors, multi-spectral, hyperspectral sensing, these are coming down in cost and becoming more prevalent in the space. And then our ability to do perception and scene understanding automatically with robotics and other things are allowing us to really get a better handle on how do we work in an unstructured environment. Um, and then we're starting to see lower cost robotics, right? Collaborative robotics um, and, and growth in autonomy coming from other fields, but primarily being driven by some of our agricultural applications. So that's just an overview of where I think we're going and what we're, what we're, what, where we're headed and some of the enabling technology. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague and good friend, Dr. Harold Sherm. So Harold. Okay, well, thanks, Doug, for having me as part of the program this afternoon. And so I do have a couple of slides specifically addressing, I think, some of the uh, questions you posed to us, Doug, for the opening statements. And so one thing that makes me different from the other panelists this afternoon is that I'm, I'm an agricultural um, and biological scientist. Uh, so I come to ActTech from a different perspective than the engineers. I think everybody else on the panel is an engineer this afternoon. And specifically, I was trained as a plant disease epidemiologist with a career long interest in using data and mathematical models to better understand and predict plant disease development and spread in space and time. And so this interest in the application of data and models and as well as the realization that agriculture is really going to be the next frontier in the generation and the need for analysis of big and complex data sets, uh, led me to uh, co-develop and currently serve as the coordinator 
of a fairly new interdisciplinary program at the University of Georgia, the uh, Graduate Certificate in Agricultural Data Science. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. I'm also currently serving as the co-chair of a cluster hire initiative in integrative precision agriculture at the University of Georgia. And so integrative precision agriculture is essentially UGA's brand for digital agriculture. And so this initiative is gonna bring five new faculty members or five new positions to the university between uh, 2021 and 2023 uh, across different colleges. So that wouldn't just be in the College of Ag and Engineering, but also uh, say in artificial intelligence and units like that. And so we are currently in the middle of the first cycle of that cluster higher surge. And then last but not least, I've uh, collaborated with Georgia Tech and specifically the Agri-Technology Research Group for nearly 10 years on various ag tech related research proposals, but also trying to develop a joint vision and roadmap for ag tech in Georgia. And I'll say more about that uh, in a minute as well. So I mentioned the uh, Graduate Certificate in Agricultural Data Science, uh, which is a relatively new program at UGA that was approved uh, a little less than two years ago. And so the program is essentially set up like a minor uh, at the graduate level for uh, enrolled graduate students at UGA in the agricultural sciences and related disciplines are presented with a structured curriculum that provides them with specialized training in agricultural data science to include data management and data mining. And I should also add that the first six students uh, graduated with the certificate during spring semester 2021, so basically a week ago. Uh, so obviously we are not training computer scientists as part of this program, but the goal is really to have graduates who can bridge the gap between the generation analysis and interpretation of complex data sets uh, in the agricultural sciences. Um, one question I was asked to address in my opening statement was where I see the opportunities for ag tech in Georgia. And I think my answer is probably going to be very similar to that of some of the other panelists. I, I envision Georgia to be the hub of the next, gen, uh, next green revolution that's driven by sensors and sensor networks, data and analytics, uh, models and decision support systems, as well as automation and robotics. And so go, the goal really here is threefold. Um, you know, from a farmer's perspective, the goal is to improve production efficiency and reduce losses through better technology and better decision-making. From the viewpoint of the university, um, ag tech is a high impact research area that sits at the intersection between the agricultural sciences, engineering and informatics. And certainly for the University of Georgia, those are all areas where we invested heavily over the past few years. And then of course, at the state level, um, the emphasis is on economic and workforce development. So the idea of attracting new industry, high tech industries, developing public private partnerships and also train Georgians for the next generation of jobs in, in high-tech agriculture at all levels. Now, why is Georgia the best place to do this? Um, you know, agriculture continues to be the top sector of the economy in the state. Uh, the most recent farm gate value was close to $14 billion a year. The overall economic impact is over $70 billion of agriculture in the state. Um, now, other states have similar aspirations, uh, but one aspect that puts Georgia in a unique position is its diverse uh, crop portfolio, and that includes major row crops such as cotton and peanut, as well as certain specialty crops, including vegetables, uh, fruit and nut crops. And so that requires unique technologies that's different from what everybody else is doing in the Midwest with corn and soybean, for example. And then likewise, uh, the high labor demand of these, special, of these specialty crops like fruits and vegetables provides a special impetus for automation and for robotics, again, more so than if you manage, you know, corn or soybeans in the Midwest on large acreage. Again, another thing that makes us different is, is Georgia's position as a major transportation hub compared with some of the big ag states in the Midwest, you know, especially the busy 
air and sea ports, and then finally the world-class agricultural sciences and engineering programs at institutions like UGA, uh, Georgia Tech, and Fort Valley State. And so this is my last slide. Um, these are some of the examples of ag technologies that get me excited as an agricultural scientist and specifically as a crop scientist. Uh, one area that's currently very active is, is that of sensor fusion or multimodal sensing. So the idea that better decisions can be made by combining data from very different sensor modalities, including imaging center, sensors, sensors that track volatiles, and then sensors that might be embedded in the plant or in the soil. Now that requires better models that are capable of, of integrating these complex data, these complex multimodal data. And that's another area where there's a lot of progress being made. Uh, obviously we've, we've had models in the past. Uh, they have not always been very reliable, but the advent of um, artificial intellig intelligence um, provides the prospect of developing more robust predictive models uh, by using machine learning for improved image classification, for example, or for dealing with small samples, missing data and data shifts. So in other words, other words, extrapolation from one field or one situation to another. As a plant pathologist, I'm very excited about precision pest management. So the idea that you try to manage insects and diseases within the field only where and when they are needed. And that's an area that's been lagging behind uh, compared with site-specific fertilizer application, for example. Uh, there are quite a few technological challenges. One is that, you know, the uh, damage that's caused by different pest species is very difficult to distinguish based on sensor data alone. And the other aspect of course, is that pests uh, tend to be highly mobile. So they move around. So even if you can use a sensor to detect damage and pests today, they may be in a different place in the field tomorrow. And so that requires the combination of advanced imaging as well as modeling to determine where the pests might have spread in the meantime. And then the last example I wanted to give is low ground crop imaging. Um, you know, we've made a lot of progress using sensors like, like multispectral imaging, for example, to determine what's going on above ground, you know, whether a crop is stressed due to nutrient imbalance or something like that. Uh, but it's been challenging to uh, monitor what's going on below ground and keep in mind about half of the plant is below ground, the roots or tubers or things of that nature. And so that's an area that's both uh, scientifically challenging but also practically very relevant, for example, to detect root diseases or to predict yield in, in below ground crops such as peanuts. And so with that as an opening statement, I'll turn it over to the next panelist. Thank you, Harold. I appreciate your uh, thoughts there. Um, uh, next up, we're gonna have Jay Shi, and she's gonna talk a little bit about some of the sensor work that she's been doing. Doug, can you hear me? We can. Thank you, Jay. All right. So thank you for the opportunity today. I'm going to actually entertain you with a story. And so the title is pretty interesting. And uh, we want to actually understand our leafy friends. And so I, I think uh, thank you, Harrod, for a really good introduction about the data and the model. So now we want to talk what kind of data and what kind of sensor we can have actually to fit into the model for the precision agriculture. So my background is uh, analytical chemist. And uh, so my research interest is on sensor development for chemical and the biological detections. And so I'd like to go to the next slide if I can. How do I go to the next slide? Okay, so maybe you have some very pleasant experience with some plant uh, smells, right? And the, some plants give you very nice, pleasant smells, and the, some plants might not be very enjoyable. And maybe have you wondered why plants emit all kinds of smells, right? And so what kind of information you can uh, like a, like a extract from those smells? 
And so if we dive in a little bit, and all those smells actually belong to a group of chemicals called the volatile organic compounds. And so they emit all kinds of uh, like organic compounds and so from almost every part of the plant. So they can emit from the flowers, they can emit the real seeds from the fruit or roots or just like, uh, you know, the leaves as, uh, as well. So, so why they emit real seeds and what information you can actually extract from real seeds. And so if we go to a little bit of biochemistry here, so, and then we know all those real seeds produced from different metabolic pathway. Okay, so, and those real seeds are directly related with the status of the plant. And if you have any variations in metabolic pathway, and those real seeds produced will be changed. So by actually looking at the VOCs and that you can dive in all those to understand the cellular info, like a level, how the plants are working and are they actually stressed? Are they happy? Do they have enough nutrients? Do they have enough water? Do they actually have some uh, like a pathogen attack? Based on all those VOC patterns, you can actually extract all those information out. So nature has been using those like very rich information and from the plant real seeds. For example, and if you plant and the flowering and it will attract the pollinators to come to pollinate. And also if you have a earth war attack the plant and the plant will actually emit this real seeds to attract this earth war predator to come to attack those earth wars. And the one actually uh, like uh, really amazed me the most, and this like a plant has been attacked by uh, pathogens or herbivores, and they actually uh, emit VOCs, and those VOCs can be received by the neighboring plant. And then the neighboring plant can actually pump up the defense mechanism and to start to uh, prepare them for the next coming attack. So this is really amazing me. And then, so, okay, nature has been using this for years. So how can we as a scientist, can we use those information and to help us to understand our leafy friends? So that's actually one of our research we have been actively pursuing. Okay, so to extract those information from plant real seed, this is involved a multidiscipline research team and the first we work with the plant biologist and to collect all those like VOC samples from the plants. And then we work actually with uh, analytical chemists and to use this uh, instrument called the gas chromatography mass spec and to understand what kind of VOC actually present in those plant samples. And then we do those, go through all kinds of data analytics and then we work with plant microbiologists again and to understand what kind of metabolic pathway actually involved for those kind of real uh, we identified using the GCMS. And, and based on those uh, discovery, and then we understand, okay, based on this looking, we know this plant is doing fine. All this plant has needs some help. Okay, so one of a couple of the enabling technology I want to mention here, actually we developed at the Georgia Tech Research Institute is one is like a robotic arms and we can do this like in field, like a tissue analysis to grab the leaves and for later lab analysis. And then another actually uh, the enabling technology is for this VOC sensor. Based on the GCMS, we know what type of VOC we want to detect. And then we use this very miniaturized VOC sensors and to identify those VOC emitted from plant. And then later on, we actually tested those sensors in a June and then just fly over and to do this chemical mapping. And the picture of those miniature sensors you can find on the right. And then in the picture at the bottom, 
and this is a flying drone and uh, uh, like a, with a sensor attached. So my uh, vision for the precision agriculture is we're going to fly this drone and then collect the real time sensing data, looking at the VOCs. And based on this the sensing data, we fit in the model. And then this model can tell us, okay, we need to apply herbicide. We need to attack, uh, like uh, apply nutrient. Oh, we already have too much water. So then we have this the smart control system, adjust the, like uh, the, uh, the either chemicals or just the, like, uh, um, like a water and a fitting system to give you very like a precise controlled fitting system. And by doing this, we're not only growing our food and the more safely nutrient rich, and we're also going to protect our environment. And so we can make the agriculture more sustainable. So I will stop my story here and just go back to Doug. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that overview and, and great explanation of VOCs and the potential for their use in, in ag tech. So our last panelist is Robbie Godboli with Agco, and Robbie's going to give us a little bit more of an industry perspective. So Robbie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hopefully you can see my screen and my slides. You see my screen? Yes, we can. Thank you. So thank you, Doug, and thank you all the panelists. I happen to know all the panelists. This is the first time that it happened, so that's great. Uh, having worked with them. Uh, so my name is uh, Ravi Godpole, as uh, Dick, Doug introduced me already. I'm an ag engineer uh, by training and uh, also been in the tractor industry for almost 20 plus years. Uh, recently in product innovation and product engineering roles primarily. So let me, uh, what, what I'm gonna to do today is introduce ACCO a little bit for those who don't, uh, those who don't know about it. And then a little bit about the products and technologies uh, that we are trying to bring to the market. So ACCO is of course, uh, one of the largest ag um, OEM and which is headquartered in Duluth, Georgia, uh, 20,000 plus employees. And uh, despite all the troubles of COVID, 2020 revenues, solid 9.1 billion. Uh, some of you might know our brands better than the name ACCO, uh, Massive Ferguson, Challenger, uh, GSI Bins, and of course, uh, those of you uh, been to Europe, Fent brand and the Nordic region, our Valtra brand. And then this new uh, brand that we are um, trying to socialize for the last few years is Fuse, uh, which is all about connecting all the assets and data. And so that's really uh, connects all our brands and services, if you will, products and services, if you will. So we sell products, services, and parts, and you know all that. But what's our challenge? You know, that's that's what I would like to focus this presentation on. So our uh, our, our main challenge is sustainable productivity growth. Uh, so we, we are trying to balance sustainability long-term and productivity in short-term or medium-term. Um, so balancing the societal pressures, government pressures with obviously farmer interests. And uh, let's see how we can do that using ActTech, right? So ActTech is one of the main ways of doing that. Within ACTO, there's been a strategy shift over the last uh, few years, um, new management, uh, fresh ideas. And so one of the things that they have set out to do is farmer first is our new strategy. It's also known as AgVance. At the heart of everything we do, we have to keep what would it gain for farmer? You know, what, what, what is the gain for our customer? Only if the customer wins, ACCO wins. And so all our energies have been focused on exceptional customer experiences, uh, high quality, but smart solutions. And then 
customer connected distributing. So being close to the customer when the customer needs, needs it. And the story is passion is at the heart of everything we do. We need farmer at the center of everything. Two ways in doing that for, you know, product portfolio, as you can see, are large combines we launched last year, Momentum Planter. Uh, you can see how uh, flexible that uh, toolbar is. And then a new tractor that was launched last year. Uh, in, in, in doing these, uh, in all these products, we have connectivity, uh, automation, robotics, electrification, and computing built. So these are the technologies uh, that are driving these new product developments. As we look to tomorrow, we think that in, you know, we have almost reached the limit of our uh, machines, the physical size and power. I think we are getting there, if not already there. So we need to think a little different uh, five years, 10 years, 15 years out. We think it could be smaller machines uh, operating in fleets. And that's where you might have heard uh, some news on our autonomous concept vehicle called Zaver, which is able to plant uh, you know, in a given land and it, it, it can work in fleets of 16 or 24 or what, whatever the farmer will prefer in future. So these are some of the products and concepts that we're working on, on the vehicle side. As you know, ACCO is also extended, has also extended its uh, product line. We, all, we have a new division called grade and protein division. Uh, it really makes us uh, truly a farm to fork company. You know, we're not just selling machines, but we're uh, all the way from seed processing to protein production solutions. So if you see those two, uh, two circles on the right and one on the left, that's part of the grain and uh, protein division that we launched recently. But there's also a lot of technology in those products as well, although they appear to be old technologies, we're trying to modernize those technologies all the time. Uh, just some examples, uh, we, we launched a new technology called GrainViz, which lets customers see moisture content uh, inside a grain mass. Uh, so it knows what the hard spots are, there's some damage going on, some corrective action can be taken. Another way we are approaching is how can we embed sensors inside our houses, you know, poultry houses or animal houses? How can we collect data or how can you use the collected data uh, to make some smart decisions uh, about those animals? And then of course, uh, whether it's the machines, uh, farms or uh, grain bins or animal houses, uh, that's the trend, right? Remote monitoring, uh, so that you, you all see these uh, commercials, you know, where the farmer is sitting in Florida Beach and controlling his farm. So that's that's hopefully we're able to give that option uh, to the to the grower or farmer. So that's that's one of the uh, one of the driving uh, technology trends we see going forward uh, to improve the equipment performance, equipment uh, management, uh, optimization. This is uh, one of the last slides. Uh, what we're really trying to do is uh, constantly thinking of ways to add value for farmers. Uh, it means that we want to improve their yield. And these are some of the points uh, that you can see across the cropping cycle, as well as reduce the waste. So any anytime uh, we want to add value, we mean we try to help him get more revenue or reduce his input costs. I think both are important. Our goal is uh, our products and services will help uh, in net farm, in, uh, farm income improvement of 20 plus years. So that's the 20, sorry, 20% 20, 20 or more. That, that, is, that is an internal goal we set out for all our products and services when we launch them. This is what we want to hit that can this do 20% improvement for the farmer? And we do this with you know, improvements in productivity, reliability, uh, ease of use, which is very important, 
and of course, uh, constantly driving innovation into our products. And we think that these are you know, common traits to all farmers and certainly for Georgia farmers, right? So Georgia farmer wants the same things. And that's where I want to end uh, my little uh, overview of ACCO and what ACCO is trying to do in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, appreciate that um, overview and the industry perspective. It's, uh, it's very important. Um, and so I think we'll transition into a bit of a discussion. And one of the things that you've heard um, through all the panelists is um, the future of ag tech is probably gonna be heavily data intensive. And I'd like to get some input from the panelists on how do you see, how do we go about collecting meaningful data and then how do we go about processing it? So anybody want to take a take a stab at, at discussing kind of the data side? I guess I'll, I'll just start. Um, we, are, we are collecting a lot of machine data uh, through our sensors on the machine. Uh, and we, we do have, you know, explicit permissions from uh, just like you know, auto companies collecting data, but but that that is uh, giving us information on how to make the machines robust, or uh, for for anything beyond the you know machine data, we rely on the relationships of farmers uh, between you know with agronomists that they so Atco says no, we will be enablers. Uh, we will not own or want to own the data, but we can help you get that data on your screen, wherever you're uh, trying to uh, access it from. We can make it easier to get that data, but we leave that data decision or you know how they want to use it, who they want to share with, uh, we, we, we leave that part uh, to the farmers. Uh, I mean, obviously there are technologies, connectivity uh, is, is itself a big topic, right? In some cases, we have great connectivity, and then in some parts of in, even in the US, there are what we call white space issues where there's. So we, we got to use the, uh, the available data bandwidth smartly. So we're trying to also have some strategies that you know you don't need to transfer data every second, uh, but only send, uh, send back pockets of data when it's most necessary. So there, there's some strategies that we are working on, but uh, that's that's our take. We are, we are enablers and helpers and then owners of the ag data. You know. I don't know if they Bob, can I comment on that real quick? Yeah, please. You know, specifically the aspect of meaningful data, and there's really two approaches to it, right? One would be to collect as much data as you can and then use a brute force approach, you know, machine learning and so forth and hope you get patterns and relationships and can make predictions. The other approach is use more of a, I guess, biology inspired approach and say, okay, we know disease changes this in the plant, for example, you know, and then, you know, changes the uh, ratio of certain pigments in the leaf and then think about it that way. And, you know, what sensor would be best to do that and then kind of use that more as a, as a more fundamental approach to get to the problem that's maybe more biology based. Well, those are I think both approaches can work. Yeah, no, that's a great I'd like to, yeah, chip in a little bit. So we also need to look for the environmental data, right? And so particular, what type of soil and do you have? And is that the soil is good for the crop? And also like, uh, you know, the, the climate data and uh, the, the, like uh, how much light you receiving on the plants and all those data and we need to integrate and the sensing fusion to make, to help us make a smart decision. Yeah, one of the unique things about agriculture is all of the different components that impact output, right? Um, whether it's disease or nutrient or even just selection of breeds. And Harold, I know you've been working in that space, right? To understand how to match different breeds of product and, and, and materials. And when we go into the protein side, 
whether it's on production or in processing, right? We're looking at trying to capture data of all of those different animals and push those through into the um, processing side to drive optimization of, of yield in terms of carcass yields and then feed conversions and things like that. So um, that, that's, that's great. I guess one of the other things that I'd like to kind of ponder a little bit, and that is um, where do we see um, some of the near-term opportunities for technology insertion into agriculture in the different spaces. So I'll throw that out as a very broad question. You can take it and make it narrow if you'd like, or move it, um, or stay very broad. So. I think in terms of something uh, that can have a immediate impact, I think precision, ag uh, precision irrigation would be one of those. The technology is there you know, in terms of having dynamic variable rate ir irrigation and things like that, that uses information on, on crop growth, on soil moisture, on environmental conditions. I think the economics hasn't been quite there. Another one that's probably very close, at least in some crops, is mechanical harvesting of certain food crops. You know, it's being practiced now with apples and strawberries, you know, neither of which are really major crops in Georgia but I think it's moving into blueberries and things of that nature. So these would be some examples of very near-term opportunities in my mind, you know, that are within a few years. Great. Jay, did you have a comment? I think I agree. And the moisture monitoring may be a little bit like uh, closer to the reality and uh, for the market. But meanwhile, like uh, what type of like uh, water sensor, right? And we also need to monitor and the type of the water coming in to irrigate the water and make sure that water is actually safe and uh, for us to actually use to, to irrigate the crop. Sure. Ravi, you have any thoughts or? Yeah, I guess um, the way we are approaching it is uh, we try to embed sensors wherever, wherever we can on the machine. Because, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, talk about the advantages of UAVs and satellite. We feel that uh, there are a lot of issues and, you know, weather related, um, you know, problems with both of those um, approaches. So what we thought, or we, we are really actively pursuing this is what if those, some of those, or many of those sensors can be mounted to these machines that are doing three, four, five passes over the field? And what kind of data can we collect? What kind of layer can we build to help manage you know, the variability and the surprises uh, for a farmer? So we're trying to uh, develop sensors you know, uh, on, on crop conditions you know, or disease uh, residue management, uh, you know, weed pressure. So the, if these sensors are mounted on the, so you can see and act, you know, that's our new uh, motto, instead of waiting. So you can, most of the, most of these uh, data is collected and right away, somebody can uh, react to it, right? It's not always easy from, uh, from a connectivity and processing uh, problems or constraints I mentioned, but in many cases, we're able to react uh, pretty, pretty fast. And so that, that's been a big, big focus of our uh, company. Good, well, thank you. Um, so we're starting to get several questions in from our audience. And so I'm gonna try and capture some of the essence of these questions and pose them um, to the panel. Um, one theme that I'm hearing in the questions is what impact is technology going to have on either the size of the farm or the cost of being a farmer or the barrier of entry to becoming a farmer. Any thoughts on what you might see there? I think it could go either way, right? I mean, there are some efforts on the way to develop some of that smart technology, you know, these small robots and things like that, that would be less costly than big machinery that's currently in place, you know, for thousands of, of acres. One example that comes to mind is a small autonomous cotton harvester that's being worked on in, in Tifton 
at the UGA campus in Tifton that's basically, you know, a small robot picking individual cotton balls and tra transporting them off. You know, and the large scale cotton harvester is $700,000 or more. And so that might be an example where technology supports smaller farms as well. You know, another example might be mechanical, might be weeding with a robot, you know, a small Roomba type robot that controls weeds in small farms, you know, or organic farms, for instance, uh, weeding oftentimes is a huge problem, big bottleneck. Yeah, scale has often been the mechanism for being able to justify investments in large pieces of equipment and technology. Um, and potentially, I agree, Harold, there could be some opportunity for looking at much smaller scale and maybe even having a higher um, intense agriculture environment where we look at things like more vertical farming or more things like that potentially um, as, as an output of enabling technology. So any other thoughts, maybe Ravi on your side of, of what technology is going to do? No, I think I agree with both of you, uh, what Harold mentioned, and you know, it, it fits with our Zauer scheme, the, the robot I showed earlier. Uh, I don't think one, uh, one robot can do uh, all the operations in a crop cycle. So we believe that there'll be, uh, there could be a robotic platform that could use uh, different attachments, but I think you will need different attachments for uh, different operations. And I, I think, we are trying to target, so you mentioned, uh, you know, just like we were trying to develop the Zawar robot such that each of those small robots can be uh, attractively uh, produced or priced uh, for a one planter unit. So we are, we are literally trying to get to that level of uh, competitiveness. Or if, if and when we launch it, it would have to be, you know, why would a farmer buy it, right? It, it, Instead of 16 row planter, he should be able to buy 14 row or you know 14 hours, and then it will give him some reliability and some uh, decision, and he can keep track of every seed sown. So that, that's our vision, and and I'm sure. So we're we're going in both directions. We, at one end, we have uh, one of the largest and the most advanced combine, uh, which is seven hundred thousand dollars. And then we're also moving into these sour like concepts. And then we'll, we'll see, uh, both will be capable. We'll see how market uh, picks both of them. But we, we believe there is opportunity for or, uh, a market for both those uh, directions going forward, 10, 15 years out. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the other questions that's come up is around educating um, the ag workforce of the future. And um, Ravi, I'm actually going to go back to you and ask, how is AgCo partnering with universities in Georgia to look at R&D and different aspects of, um, of technology infusion into uh, agriculture? Yeah, well, thanks for asking. So we're not just headquartered here. Uh, we are uh, engaging with uh, many of the universities. Uh, as you know, we partner quite a bit uh, with Georgia Tech and Georgia Tech Research Institute on automation, robotics projects, uh, also chemical sensing uh, that Jay mentioned. Uh, also, we've, we've had discussions on the poultry and egg uh, research, uh, Doug. So there are some live projects and some we have finished. Uh, it's been, and some of, our, some of the work from GTRI has been uh, very helpful in our strategy discussion on autonomy even. So that was, that was very well received. So it's great input from university. Uh, for UGA, you know, we are actively working with Tifton campus uh, on crop and uh, animal sciences research. Uh, we're also working with some, some of the progressive farmers around uh, Tifton area that they connected us with. So that, that's another gain. Uh, working also with GSU, Tech and UGA in terms of you know uh, sponsoring senior senior design uh, students, a couple of our people are also on their uh, advisory board, uh, and so we're trying to engage uh, wherever possible. Uh, unfortunately, our you know engineering and manufacturing facilities are are not in Georgia yet, uh, but other than an assembly center in Savannah, but. 
uh, we definitely engage in research and student projects and where our people from Minnesota and Kansas fly here uh, specifically for these meetings. So I uh, absolutely love uh, the uh, great support we get from uh, three universities that we're engaging with so far. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Robbie. And, and Harold, I'm going to actually ask you to comment just a little bit about how your certificate program is, is, is starting to equip students for this kind of shift into a more data set intensive um, agricultural system. Yeah, I mean, so the goal is really to, to make these students that are essentially agricultural scientists, you know, they are not computer scientists or engineers to make them more data savvy. So when they come out of this, they won't be computer scientists, as I said earlier, but they will speak the language, you know, and will make that connection between the agricultural problem and then the data science approach to solve the problem. So that's what we are really, what we are re really trying to do with this program. And it's really just a step, you know, a first step in that direction. I mean, we hope to expand that in the future. As I mentioned, the certificate is really just a minor for these students that they do alongside their main program, you know, that might be in crop science or food science or whatever the case might be. So I'm thinking about a potentially a non-thesis master's degree in agricultural data science that might be very attractive that could potentially be put on online, you know, at a distance. At other levels, we are starting to work with technical colleges on curricula in precision agriculture, you know, and that includes data and things of that nature. So yeah, it, it, it starts to permeate, you know, a lot of things we do at the university in the agricultural sciences. And you and I, Harold, were part of a road mapping exercise several years ago. And one of the key elements that came out of that was equipping the future generation and looking for joint programs between engineering science and um, the ag sciences. And I think that that overlap is really going to be fruitful. And I'm hoping that we can still see some opportunities in that space. Um, I'm going to shift a little bit to some of the sensor side of things. And Jay, there's a few questions that have come in regarding VOC sensing and analysis. One is for vertical and soilless farming. Do you see VOC sensing being applicable in that space and how? Yes, so the VOC sensing can be used for vertical and the soilless, like a farming. And I haven't seen any actually research in that area, but just since all the VOC can be produced from the plants, from their metabolic pathway, so I don't see there's any like a difficult or challenge on that. And maybe a follow-up is how would you see the sensors that are being developed and some of these technologies being able to be used at very small scale? So maybe community gardens or local food areas. Do you see opportunity in that space as well? So the goal is to make the sensor low cost, right? And uh, uh, accessible to all kinds of farmers. So I don't say, you know, and maybe for the like a small farm, we can make the sensor handheld and then we can just uh, take the sensor work around and then we can do the mapping to understand the status of the plant. And the, for big farm, maybe we can put the sensor in, a, you know, you know, and the UAV, you know, drone and to do the large scale sensing. Great, great. And we're coming up on the end of our time here uh, together this morning. And I wanted to give each of the panelists just, a, just an opportunity to say, uh, or to give some insight on two areas. What are hurdles that, that, are, that are, you know, potential blocks for us to really see more technology make its way into agriculture? And then what are the huge opportunities that maybe 15 to 20 years from now um, and you don't have to be right on this, but just what's your crystal ball say about technologies moving into, into the future? And maybe, maybe we'll start with Jay on this one. Jay? So I think, uh, you know, to work with actually the biology, right? The plant, and it's very complex, the system. And uh, based on the VOC data, right, and the work, the, the project we did before, and a little bit of light change, and a little bit of temperature change, and a little bit of condition of the soil change, and it might alter and the data you are collecting. 
and really how to correlate the data with the true status of the plant. I think it's still a challenge. There's still a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, so I, I think, uh, you know, and uh, we, we, to move forward from this, we need to maybe like uh, dive in from the fundamental, really to understand the VOC uh, relation with the plant uh, like, uh, like uh, status. I think that's a real challenge. Great. Um, maybe Ravi, thoughts on what are some of the hurdles and what are some of the great opportunities long term? Yeah, I, I think so we get too hung up on uh, big machinery, right? So we want a big, uh, bigger and faster machines. Uh, I think we are reaching the physical growth uh, limit. Uh, so I think the so the low hanging opportunities would be sensors and technology to make the current machinery more efficient uh, using robotics where we can, you know, we, we ought to be trying for, you know, low power, weight, high precision and traceability. That, that should make our operations more precise and more efficient uh, as for the current, you know, product, uh, as far as current products or those being developed are concerned and be always uh, not running after bigger and bigger machine, but more efficient and more precise and uh, how can we add value right, for, the, for the end goal? Right. Um, right, so moving more towards that lot size of one allows you to have smaller units, but maybe more of them and deploy them in different aspects or different ways, which I also see enabling much smaller farms to be viable in the long term. Absolutely, period. absolutely. So, Oh, that's great. That's good. Harold? I guess my roadblock is not technological, but more, you know, related to what I mentioned earlier on my first slide. You know, we've been talking about that statewide vision for agri-technology for many years now. I mean, um, almost 10 years, and it's really never happened. You know, everybody agrees it's important. The growers agree we need more technology. The universities see it as an important area. Industry sees it as an important area. The state, obviously, as well. But we've never really been able to provide a structure to bring everybody together on a long-term basis. You know, not just once, but actually, you know, continuous in, in a continuous way, and and you know, some somehow have a consortium or a co-op of some sort that also might provide some funding to push these things forward, you know, through membership fees from universities or industry or, you know, levies from grower groups and things of that nature. So unless we get some sort of a consortium like that statewide, I think we're just chasing our tails. Now that's a great point. And Harold, you and I have worked um, along with several of our industry folks to try and think about that, which was one of the um, reasons for going through the road mapping exercise that you and I did with our with our colleagues at the Department of Agriculture here in Georgia, and um, I think you're absolutely right in terms of support and and um, activities. Until there's a real common opportunity for us to pursue, and that usually requires funding of some sort, it's very hard to get folks together and pull them into a common um, into a common area. Um, so I know some of the questions were around is, are there groups working in that? And, and, and while there might be some groups and it's, it's really going to be kind of an ad hoc one off, you know, individual faculty members working between disciplines and between areas. But one of the goals that we have in the Ag Tech program at Georgia Tech, and I know UGA and Harold has been instrumental in supporting us, our friends in the poultry science department, Dr. Applegate and his team have been supporting this, is to really enable these what we call um, intentional collisions, right, and fostering this collaboration and building this overlap between the engineering side and then the plant science or the ag science or the animal science side, because it's in that white space and overlap in between that we see significant opportunity. And we see that Georgia could have a very unique position to lead in that space, given the diversity of the agricultural portfolio that exists here in the state. And so I think we would probably like to say that, and I'm going to kind of wrap up here as a, as a whole, but um, I think that's really the opportunity as we look forward down the, down the path. We have two terrific 
um, uh, research universities. We have other universities here that are doing great work in the space. And I think there's plenty of opportunity for us to um, partner and, and collaborate on that. So I'd like to thank um, Harold, you and Ravi and Jay for being part of this panel and Jamal and Christy and um, Deborah, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present. We just really appreciate the, uh, the chance to have this dialogue with all of you. So I'll hand it back to Jamal. Perfect. Thank you, Doug. Um, as it is now one o'clock, we are out of time, but I would like to thank all, all of our panel um, participants uh, for the great discussion on ag tech research and opportunities in Georgia. Um, and we would also like to thank all of you so much for joining us today. Uh, we encourage you to please continue to monitor our website for upcoming Smarter Together webinars. Uh, and we look forward to uh, you all joining us next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.